So my full name is Giuseppina Benincasa Feingold. I go by Dr. Feingold just because it's a lot easier. Most people can pronounce my name. <laughs> I got into hyperbaric oxygen therapy mostly because of my daughter, actually, only because of my daughter. Um, I had uh, my second pregnancy was a, a child who um, had brain damage at birth. She uh, suffered a severe bleed and we were not sure where she would end up when she was born. Um, they told me that she could be anywhere between like mild um, developmental delay to a complete vegetative state and and that was about it and uh, I took her home she was not progressing at all and by the time that she was three and a half she could say maybe 30 words that were comprehensible only to the immediate family and she was not toilet trained uh, she had severe drooling uh, could not sit unsupported, and basically that was our life. Um, someone suggested at that time that I do hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and to me that was the absurd. I thought this was the weirdest thing that somebody could suggest. And the, the sad thing is that I happened to be um, the first female doctor in my little hometown of in Italy and um, most women are not educated there or at least they weren't at the time that I lived there and um, therefore I thought I was a big shot because I was a doctor already and so when somebody suggested to me that I should take my daughter to do hyperbaric oxygen therapy I thought they had two heads I thought I knew it all. I was a pediatrician. My husband was a pediatrician, and both of us knew what we were doing. And this person from my hometown continued to bother my mother about it until um, one time he said, I'll pay for it if you just take her. And so I said, okay, there's got to be something to this. And so we treated her, and she was, Elisa was part of the one study that was being conducted at Cornell uh, New York Hospital and I remember calling the neurologist and saying to her look I have a big house five kids one who's handicapped and two jobs if this is all snake oil let me know because I won't do it and she said I I started out trying to prove that it was snake oil and I've become convinced that it does work and one of the uh, examples she gave me was there was a child who had cortical blindness and started to see, and another one who had uh, his hands so clenched that the mother had difficulty opening up the hands to wash his hands, and he went from that to a pincer. Now, developmentally, a child goes through first a rake, so like monkeys, they, they grab things like this, and then something which is developmentally more advanced is a pincer. And what happened with this child, they went from hypertonia, severe hypertonia, to a pincer. That's developmentally much more advanced. So I said, okay, I'm convinced. So I treated my daughter, and she had her first 40 treatments in 1999. And then once I saw that she started to talk, I took her for another 80 treatments. So she did 120 treatments between December of 99 and June of 2000. And by that time, she could speak in sentences and was toilet trained night and day. So that's how I got into it. So, so you stay in the chamber for 60 minutes at pressure. That is, it takes time to get to that pressure because basically what you're doing is you're um, pumping in either air or oxygen and causing an increase in pressure. We're all under one atmosphere of pressure which is what we're uh, this column of air that we're under. Um, 
if we want to increase that, we need to find a way to increase that. And usually it's going into a chamber, much like when you put water with gas, with carbon dioxide, in a, a, a bottle. You have to create some kind of pressure, otherwise the bubbles all go out. So you have to create pressure, and that will take various times depending on the condition of the child, how sensitive they are, the pressure that we want to go to. So there are times that it takes us 10 minutes, there are times that it takes 20 minutes to get to the pressure that we desire. And then once they're at that pressure, we stay for 60 minutes. So first of all, before we look at what the studies show, we need to understand the process. Like what exactly happens? So as I said, we're all under this column of air. And if you look at the gas laws that we studied back in high school, the amount of gas that is in a liquid. So for example, we breathe 21% oxygen, but there is oxygen in water as well. This is why when that exchange cannot happen, the fish go belly up because there's no getting oxygen to them. They can't breathe. So that amount of gas which is in the liquid depends on three things. One, it's obvious, if we use instead of 21% oxygen and we use 100% oxygen, we see that we have an increased amount of oxygen in the liquid medium. If we increase the temperature, then particles move because particles are constantly in motion. Atoms are constantly in motion. So those particles will move at a faster rate and will hit the surface of the liquid more frequently. So they have more of a probability of going in. And then pressure. So what the studies have shown is that pressure happens to be one of the best ways to increase oxygenation. Otherwise we would all be putting a mask of oxygen on these kids and watching the results. That didn't pan out. It's actually pressure. So what that causes is hyperoxygenation of your blood. And what that will in turn cause is a process, uh, an activation of several biomedical pathways. One, it causes neovascularization, which means it causes the formation of new blood, blood vessels. This is why it works for wounds. And so wounds happen usually in the lower extremities because that's where the blood supply is the least. So by increasing oxygenation in your plasma, you're causing more blood vessels to then form and you have more blood supply to that area. So there's also other properties. There's anti-inflammatory properties. And then there's a, a, a theory that Dr. Neubauer, who was a pioneer in this kind of medicine and for its application, which is the activation of neurons around an, an area that is believed to be damaged. So when you have a bleed, when you have a stroke, when you have trauma, you lose nervous tissue and nobody's going to get that back. We're not playing gods here. We're not, it doesn't happen. But the area that's damaged, directly damaged, that's not coming back. But the area around it, what he postulated was that these neurons were somehow inactive. And he called it idling neurons that were basically, they could be activated, but they weren't active, but alive. So if you put someone in hyperbaric conditions, those neurons, so that tissue, becomes active. And he was able to show that utilizing SPECT imaging. Not everybody does SPECT imaging because you have to sedate the child. Plus, the insurance companies will only pay for one, and you want to show a before and after. 
He was able to do that because he wasn't practicing in the state of New York, and he also had his own machine that he could do SPECT imaging on every patient. But he was able to show that those neurons, that area of tissue, actually became active. So what does that cause? Well, it, obviously, if you have one central area that's done, it's, it's necrotic, you're not getting that back. But around that area, you still have neurons that are functional. So by activating them, you get more function. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what your brain looks like. If it doesn't correlate to function, it has absolutely no value. There was a very um, knowledgeable uh, doctor who I met many years ago in this field. And his name was Philip James. And he used to give a lecture, do we actually really need a brain to function? And he did something which in the United States would be unthinkable, unthinkable. We'd go to jail if we did it. And he did CAT scans on all the medical students. He was teaching in Dundee. And so he did CAT scans on everybody. And they were all medical students. And he found that one student had a little sliver of cortex. So do we really need all that material? Probably not. I mean, people say that we only use 10% of our brains. I don't know how they came to that. But the bottom line is, if the anatomy of the brain, if you have a perfect anatomy but have no function, to me, it, has, it makes no sense. It, it, I can't stress that enough. I've had patients who had traumatic brain injury one gentleman who later on subsequently passed away, and he had a near drowning. And when you looked at the imaging of his brain, it was perfect. But he was in a vegetative state, completely inactive, unable to speak, unable to move, unable to do anything at all. So to me, it's far more important that we have function and, and not anatomy, perfect anatomy. So when you look at children who have cerebral palsy, who have traumatic brain injury, who have bleeds, what you want to look at is how functional can I get that individual? I have an example with, I have many examples, because in the past 20 years we've witnessed many miracles. In fact, I remember when I first spoke about treating my daughter, I was in mainstream pediatrics, I was, was assistant director of an emergency room, and I said, I posted something online, and in those days I don't even remember how it was posted, but I remember saying I didn't see miracles, but I saw my daughter speaking, and she is no longer wearing diapers, night and day. And I remember Dr. James, Philip James, responded to me and said, I beg your pardon, Dr. Feingold. You've been changing diapers for three and a half years, and now you're not. You don't call that a miracle? I'm like, you are correct. You're correct. Because whenever you look at, at the evaluation of a particular form of therapy, you have to have realistic expectations. So when I treat somebody, for example, with an ear infection, I say 65% of the time this little bottle of pink medicine that I'm going to give you will work. The other 35, it won't. We have to try something else. There's not that expectation that we're going to get 100% results. And that's true of anything in medicine. You know, uh, uh, even surgical procedures. You know, we don't expect 100% results. And there, there are studies that are ongoing and studies that show that for traumatic brain injury, you actually have a very nice response. For cerebral palsy, the numbers are actually pretty well defined. And that is, 
you have an improvement in about two-thirds of, of children that are treated. Now, we can't predict which ones are not going to respond. We have no idea. But two-thirds usually respond with cognitive changes, which to me are far more important than mobility issues. Mobility issues, they, ha they, they have very sophisticated equipment now. Um, my daughter has a wheelchair that goes up and down. When we go to the supermarket, if I can't reach something, she says, I'll get it. And she mm -hmm. up and gets it and gives it to me. They now make wheelchairs that go up and down the stairs. They make wheelchairs with the, uh, the, those motorized segways, right? That, uh, like even catching a ball, right? If somebody is paralyzed from the waist down, if you catch a ball, you, your body has to be, like your body already understands that when you get hit with that ball that it needs to cause a certain resistance and these wheelchairs are so sophisticated that they're able to do that. So these people get around and they do all kinds of sophisticated things. But if you don't understand that you can do that and if, you, if you're not with it enough to understand language, to be able to express yourself, then what's the point that you're able to walk around? I think it's so much better that you're capable of communicating. And this, the studies showed exactly that. It was communication. It was cognitive development, which was far superior in, in change. Once I saw the results that we had with my daughter, I became really disillusioned with medicine because I said, wait a minute, if I would have treated her three years ago, who knows where she would have ended up. And now, here's my daughter who still doesn't sit unsupported, and I said, we have to be able to give her more treatments. After the first 40 treatments that we did at Cornell, I had to take her out of the country. And it became really taxing on my family because she has four other siblings who did not want to be separated from her. So I sold my house and I bought my first chamber. And that's when I met Bart. And I, I met Bart like in 2000, 2001, thereabouts. Um, and his history was that he was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He had severe traumatic brain injury and the parents just really were desperate to find something that would help. The parents are very articulate, wonderful people who did all the research, and they came to me and asked me, would you treat him? And in all of these things, you have to weigh, if I treat, what are the risks I'm taking? So what are the risks I'm taking in treating a patient with traumatic brain injury, and I'm putting them in a chamber at 1.5 atmospheres. They're minimal. They are. They're just really minimal. So I decided to go ahead and treat. And he was my first TBI that I treated. And the results were amazing. The criticism that I got was equally amazing in a negative way. Um, I spoke to his physiatrist when I first started to treat, and she said, he, you are a quack, and you should not treat him. He will amount to nothing. I said, okay, at least I'm trying. And I've kept in touch with Bart over the years, and he has done incredibly well. So. That's where I'm saying the expectations that we had. Like, do I plan to treat someone who is in a comatose state and then after 40 treatments watch them walk out of my office and be completely normal? No, it's absurd. But is a patient who's had traumatic brain injury and is incontinent and therefore wearing a diaper isn't he worse off than one who is not wearing a diaper and can go to the bathroom by themselves? Absolutely. I have a child who I treated for traumatic brain injury. He was 13 years old and he was wearing a helmet but got hit right here beneath the helmet. 
and he was in a coma for two months. By the time I saw him, the doctor said, there's nothing more to do for him. Transfer him to a chronic care facility. And I knew the mother, and I said, let's try. Let's just try. And um, every time she would come to my office, she would get so excited because she would see this little improvement. So he was able to sit in a wheelchair, but that's all he was able to do. There was no speech. There was a tracheostomy. There was a GT tube. He was incontinent. There was absolutely just movements like this and no eye contact. So she would get excited because he started to push with his feet against the floor to move the wheelchair. And then he started to move his lips. And then he started to move his arms. And slowly but surely, trach was out, GT tube out. He is fully mobile. And he, I'm happy to say he started his first year in college this year. He graduated high school on time. Bart, you're, you understand it's 18 years ago, and I don't have his chart, but I know that he was not verbal. He was walking, but needed maximal assistance. Um, he was not making eye contact. And basically, that was one of the first things we started to see, eye contact and speech. So communication is so important, because that's how, you, you know, you, communicate, you have to communicate in order to be able to be toilet trained because otherwise, what's the purpose? You say, okay, I can go to the bathroom by myself, but if I can't communicate it to somebody to take me there or I can't go there by myself. And so those were the first things, as I remember, that, we, that he did. I believe he did the first 40. Then when we started to see progress, he did another 40. Usually I make them take a break of at least a month to six weeks before we start again. So the side effects are, you know, they decrease with the, the different pressure. Uh, you know, traumatic brain injury gets treated at 1.5 atmospheres. So 1.5 atmospheres is like about 10 feet of water, as if you're diving in 10 feet of water. So you have to understand that with changing pressures, you have places in your body where there's gas, liquid, and solids that are in uh, all together, you're going to have expansion of gas, so you're going to have pressure. So you can have pressure of your sinuses because they're air-filled. So as the, uh, first of all, as the gas compresses because you're going to a higher pressure, you may feel a sinus crunch and your ears, just like when you fly, it's, it's about the same, the, the, that discomfort. Um, you can have oxygen toxicity if you do it way, way too much. Um, you can have problems with change in vision because the pressure on your lens causes your lens to also get thinner and thicker, and so you have change in vision, but that is not, um, that's not permanent. Um, and in children that have seizures, like if you have a seizure, you're not supposed to bring somebody up right away. You're supposed to let them come up slowly. You don't want someone to bear down, so to close their, their, their glottis, the, hold their breath, and you bring them up because then the gas in the lung expands and you can cause someone to have a pneumothorax, which could be very dangerous. Now, most adults, if you tell them breathe normally, they will breathe normally, and it's not a problem. Even patients who are not conscious, they'll breathe normally. They'll just continue to breathe. They don't hold down their, their, their glottis. The only problem is if someone is having a seizure, then you need to know when you can bring them up. And, and so you don't want to take them up when they're at that state, when they're not breathing, where they're in, in a uh, tonic state, where they're just rigid and not breathing. That would be dangerous.
So the soft chambers can go up to a maximum of 1.3 atmospheres. The hard chambers go anywhere between 1.1 or whatever we want it to be to 3, even 6 atmospheres depending on the chamber. Now, the soft chambers were designed to treat high altitude sickness. So when people go mountain climbing and the air is not only, it's not only because the air is thinner and therefore has less oxygen, it's also because the pressure is lower. So when you go up in the mountains, the pressure that it's exerted on your body is less. Therefore, you're having less oxygen pushed into your blood. And, and you can develop a disease in which you have somewhat severe conditions from lack of oxygen, so poor oxygenation. You have, you, you start to breathe faster, you become tachycardic. And from those mild symptoms to all the way into a coma, uh, altered mental status. So what they do is they take the soft chambers, bring them up, put the patient inside it, pump them up so that you're creating a hyperbaric condition and, and patients respond very nicely to that because it was seen that even though the change in pressure is only from 1 to 1 1.3, the change in intracranial pressure is actually significant and these patients feel so much better and they bring them down and then they keep them in a hyperbaric chamber or you may choose to put them even into a different hyperbaric chamber that has higher pressure but they're mobile and they use air so it's actually not hyperbaric oxygen it's hyperbaric air and we're using the gas laws to create hyper oxygenation so it's a milder treatment it has a lot less side effects There are 14, now 14 indications that are approved and therefore that the insurance company will pay for. So one of them is carbon monoxide poisoning. So carbon monoxide is a gas which when you have smoke and smoke inhalation, it binds to hemoglobin in a covalent way. So that means, so Really, when you look at the body and when you look at physiology, we are perfect. We're perfect in every way. When you study every function, it is absolutely perfect for our environmental conditions. So if hemoglobin binds to oxygen in a covalent way, which means it really sticks to it, you can't get rid of it. So you have to bind oxygen in a way that when it goes back to the tissues, that it will release the oxygen. So hemoglobin doesn't bind covalently to oxygen. It kind of holds on to it, but not tightly. And this way it goes, it goes in the lungs, into the blood, and then releases it to the tissues. Carbon monoxide doesn't do that. Carbon monoxide goes in and sticks to the hemoglobin and refuses to move. So it becomes very dangerous. How do you get rid of that? How do, you, how do you reverse that? It was seen that with hyperbaric oxygen, the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin becomes much less. So it, it's, it's able to let go of the carbon monoxide and then pick up oxygen. So that is the reason why these, these machines were built, for these reasons, for that, for the bends. So when somebody, just as I was explaining to you about the difference in pressure and concentration of gas in the liquid medium, when I increase the pressure, I'm pushing more gas into the liquid medium. So I'm pushing more gas into your blood. When you come up, the opposite occurs. Just like when you open up a bottle of carbonated drinks, you open it up and it starts to bubble. Well, the same thing will happen if you are at a significant pressure doing deep sea diving and then you come back up. If you come up too fast, then you have these bubbles that form in your blood vessels and they cause emboli and they cause a very painful, painful um, condition called the bends all the way up to a coma and death. 
So the chambers were created to, you can't, like, you can't put them back in the water. If somebody comes up too fast because there's a shark or because there's no oxygen down there, you can't put them back in the water and create. So we created these machines, not I. These machines were, were designed to simulate that. You actually have to document what you have. You can't kind of fudge it. There have been people that were treated for a diabetic foot who also had a stroke. You don't get diabetes, you don't get a diabetic foot unless you have diabetes and then you have cardiovascular disease and you have all sorts of other problems. Or, for example, somebody who is treated for wounds, for non-healing wound. Well, you don't get an athlete who has a non-healing wound. You, ha you get someone who has COPD, who has all kinds of cardiovascular problems and they have decreased perfusion. So we have seen, as a side effect, an improvement in their cognition and their neurologic status. It, it actually varies according to what kind of chamber you're using. It varies according to um, place where you get treated because if you get treated in a hospital, wound care pays very nicely. So they have to charge what they charge for Medicare reimbursement. And so it's about $1,000 for one treatment, whereas the maximum that we charge for the same type of treatment is $250. So the soft chamber, you don't have to charge as much because it doesn't require skilled, a skilled personnel, doesn't require liquid oxygen. So there's things that definitely impact the cost of the treatment itself. So I would say anywhere between 50 and $250 per treatment. Treatments. Well, the studies actually were done at 1.5 atmospheres, but we have seen patients respond even at 1.3. So what I tell people is, you know, if you are in an area that has hard chambers and you can take your child to that chamber, by all means do it. But if you happen to be in an area where you don't have this accessible to you and therefore you're kind of stuck, these chambers are even approved for home use. So you can rent one, you can buy one and, and treat yourself. You, you need to be under the direction of a doctor, but you can, you can do that. A chamber a little smaller than this will cost about 23000 It really doesn't matter. It's obvious that if you have an injury, you should treat almost immediately so that you have the better outcome. But um, I would not refuse treatment for someone because years have gone by. It's important that you wait because people tend to attribute your improvement to other things. So. Even myself, when my daughter was first diagnosed, you know, when what they tell you is, well, she could be anywhere from completely normal to a complete vegetable in a vegetative state. What does your mind go to as a mother? Oh, she could be completely normal. Well, what does a normal one-month-old do? A normal one-month-old sucks, sleeps, and poops. That's about it. So you can't justify the cost and the time and the impact that it has on the family because they're not doing much. So you can't really go by what they're doing. A, a one-year-old looks very different than a one-month-old. And so a one-year-old who is just sucking, not able to walk, not able to talk, is already very different. And so you can see these changes and therefore appreciate what's going on. You can't even justify not the cost, not the time, or any, the effort that you put into it. So why won't insurance companies and other doctors accept this as a form of treatment and, and therefore pay for it? What is it going to take? I think as with anything, 
more studies are required. Unfortunately, the people who make the machines are not, the markup is not that great, so they're not making that much money in order to finance studies. But there are studies that are going on. When I started this 20 years ago, and I would talk about hyperbarics, people looked at me like, what's that? I don't understand. What now, instead, people are saying, oh, I've heard of that. I've so it's becoming more common, and definitely the soft chambers have made it more affordable and therefore available to more people. And I just think it's, it's just a matter of time and a matter of doing more studies. I think it's a form of therapy which is safe and it can have a profound effect on someone suffering from TBI. And therefore, I don't see any reason why people wouldn't do it.